Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. So as a reminder, uh, there's just one quiz this week, right? Yeah. Because, so last week there was just one quiz because of the closure of campus due to that um, bomb threat. And then this week there's one quiz because the university was closed on the 4th. Okay, but next week we'll have, we'll be back to two quizzes. Okay, any question about uh, the quizzes? Okay, uh, so last time uh, we were talking about the method of Lagrange multipliers. And to remind you uh, of that situation, So the method comes to this, is that given two functions, so given the objective function, f of x and y, this is, this function is the function to minimize or maximize and given a second function, the constraint g of x, of x and y uh, and the constraint that it must be zero. Uh, the critical points, critical points are given by solutions <coughs> to the following system of equations that the x partial is a multiple. What's the name of this letter? Can you remember? Lambda. Lambda. Uh, is lambda times the constraint partial and then the y partial of the objective is lambda times the y partial of the constraint and <clears throat> the constraint is true. Okay, uh, wait a second, yeah, that's right, okay. So, as a reminder, so in the first place, it is, it's enough for our purposes for you to just memorize this in a sense, but I would really like for you to understand what each bit of it means. So this means, these equations that have partials in them, this means that locally, if you are a little bitty creature in the, the world set up by the objective and the constraint, what these mean is that the objective and the constraint, in a sense, have become parallel to each other. And this means that you're still on the constraint. You haven't accidentally left the constraint. So that's what these uh, together mean. So that being said now, let's, um, let's answer a question, or a, a, a relatively complicated one, actually. So on the, I gave, I don't know, like three or four such Lagrange questions on the written homework. Uh, the first couple, especially the first one, is pretty easy, I think, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, the one, there's another one involving cylinders. That one is more interesting. Uh, so we're going to solve one that's, that is probably twice as hard as that one. 
here and now, just so you can see the, the sort of depth and breadth of difficulty that these can achieve. But so I'm, I'm telling you in advance that it's, it's a, you know, it's involved. It's kind of a beast of a question. But to put you at ease, uh, <laughs> so as not <laughs> to build up anxiety, I don't want you to think that this is the kind of question that I would ask on a quiz. Okay? On a homework, sure. But not on a quiz. <laughs> so don't. <laughs> I'm not trying to put you into a state of panic. Okay. So here's the question. Uh, so find the dimensions. and volume of a closed rectangular box, closed rectangular box with maximal Uh, volume given a surface area of six square meters. Okay. So let's try and parse uh, this question. So in the first place, uh, in the first place, what does it mean closed? In this context, what does that mean, closed? Yeah, it means that we're talking about a box that has six sides. So for example, is this box open or closed? Open, right? Because it's just got five sides. So this is not a closed box. A closed box would be if even this side, which is not there, was actually there. That'd be a closed box. So this means that it has all six sides. Or all six faces are present. Okay, what does rectangular mean? This one, in, in, a, in a way, is kind of so obvious that it's kind of difficult to, st to say. It means that all faces are rectangles. <laughs> And in particular, that means that all faces have to meet at a right angle. <clears throat> so it, it's not leaning over. Like you could imagine, like, like if, if this box was somehow hinged a little bit and I could sort of lean it over and one of this front face would become a parallelogram. So it's not like that. Okay. <clears throat> so the question, the question is, is Suppose that we consider the entire universe of boxes, such boxes, that have surface area six. And the question is, is which one of them encloses the max maximum volume? So to sort of uh, get, get you <coughs> thinking about this, you can imagine something like a pizza box. That is to say that, one of the, that, it, that it's quite flat, like a pizza box that one of the sides is quite big and so is, so is the side opposite it. So we've got a flat, a flat box. Uh, that's one possibility. Another possibility would be a box like that you might put a baseball bat in it so that it's sort of really long and skinny. That's another kind of box. <laughs> you, could, you could really enclose quite a big baseball bat with six square meters, <laughs> right? 
But at any rate. The question is, is that of all conceivable boxes, including pizza boxes and baseball bat boxes, which box will enclose the maximum volume? So but we're going to do this in particular. Um, we're, going to, we're going to answer this question using the method of Lagrange multipliers. But I want to point out to you that really you already know the answer to this question. What kind of box is optimal in that way? What kind of box encloses the maximum amount of volume for a minimum amount of surface area? A cube. A cube does. You can't do any better than that. So that's, that's if what you wanted to do was enclose the maximum amount of volume. To which you might respond, well, then why don't they make pizzas shaped, pizza boxes shaped like that? And what's the answer? Because that's not the way pizza is shaped, right? <laughs> okay. So if the only constraint <coughs> was that we're considering the universe of all possible boxes and they've, they've just got to have six square meters of surface area, then the box that contains the maximum amount of volume is a cube. And there's many such instances of optimal shapes. So I have a, a to, to remind you of all these occurrences. Suppose that there's a farmer, <laughs> which is funny because every, every calculus class somehow, calculus one class has to somehow talk about farmers and fences. A farmer wants to build a fence, blah, blah, blah. So suppose that, suppose that a farmer wants to build a rectangular enclosure, a rectangular one. And this rectangular enclosure is supposed to enclose the maximum amount of area. What is the optimal rectangle that encloses the maximum amount of rectangle, supposing you have a fixed perimeter? What's the optimal one? A square. That's what encloses the most. A square encloses the most area. Okay. So that, that is to say, you know, if we were out in the middle of Kansas, out in the middle of nowhere, and I said, well, we've got one kilometer of fence, and I want you to enclose the maximum amount of area within this fence, and you're, you have to use exactly this much and no more, the best thing you can do is make a square. That's it. That's the best you can do. Okay, now I have a separate question. <clears throat> Again, in 3D. So the optimal shape that encloses the maximum amount of volume that is, a, rect that is a, a box, a rectangular prism, is a cube. That's the best one. But what if we consider the whole universe of possibilities of shapes? That is to say, not just, not just boxes, but maybe things shaped like pyramids and giraffes or whatever, broccolis. What is the optimal shape of all conceivable shapes that encloses the maximum volume for a given surface area? And you, this, this is another one that I, I promise you, you know. What shape encloses the maximum volume? A sphere. Sphere encloses the maximum volume. Of course, that is exactly the reason why all of the stars and all of the planets beyond a certain mass have a shape like a sphere. That's exactly why. Now, the Earth isn't exactly a sphere, and that's not even, that, that's still discounting the fact that there's mountains and things. Even if we were to discount the mountains, which are very small aberrations in the sphere, the Earth is still not a sphere. It's actually, it's actually kind of fatter at the equator. Why? because it's rotating, right? So the centrifugal force, centripetal force really, is causing it to bulge slightly. But if the Earth were not rotating, it would be a sphere, just basically exactly a sphere. Okay? Uh, there's lots, lots and lots of examples. What if, what if I said, okay, we're back in Kansas and we have a kilometer of fence 
and I want you to enclose the maximum possible area. And it doesn't need to be a rectangle. It can be any shape that you want, any shape at all. What's the optimal shape to enclose the maximum area if you have to use exactly one kilometer mm -hmm. of fence? A circle. You cannot enclose more area than a circle. And it's for reasons like this, for reasons like this, that if you were to take a drop of water and very carefully put it on a table, then its cross section, its interface with the table would be a circle. Okay, there's lots and lots of reasons. And, and, and humans really do, if you, if you consider it enough and think about it enough, you really can come to these conclusions more or less on your own without the aid of calculus is what I mean to say. That being said, I'd like to point out that the entire purpose of this section is to use the method of Lagrange multipliers. So if you don't use the method of Lagrange multipliers, it doesn't matter how clever or insightful you are, you have failed to follow the instructions, okay? So what I'm telling you is that we know at the outset that the answer to this is a cube. We know that at the outset. The purpose is to show that that's a fact using the method of Lagrange multipliers. And I'm telling you this by way of warning because I wouldn't want anyone to get to the method of Lagrange multipliers question on the quiz and say, oh, he's asking me for an optimal rectangle. Well, that's a square. So the answer is a square. And then for you to get zero points on such an exercise. Okay, I don't want that to happen to anyone. And that, that's why the question will say, using the method of Lagrange multipliers. <laughs> Good, so any, is, is it clear before we get to the actual exercise? Okay, so let's try and understand the question. Let's make a sketch. So, um, hmm. so I'm trying to sketch a box, and I'm going to try and make all the faces mm -hmm. have a different size, only because even though we know that they're all going to have to have the same size, I'm going to try and make it to where at least I'm not assuming that in my picture. box. Now we need to come up with um, names for each of the measurements of the box. So what do you want to call this, this measurement right here? L? Length? Okay. Uh, so I'll write L. Like this. I don't, I'm not going to write lowercase L because they end up looking too similar to <coughs> ones and things like that. Hey, what do you want to call this one? Y, okay. And then what do you want to call this one? X, X. okay. <coughs> it really makes no difference, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> as long as you don't use something confusing or difficult to write. <laughs> so uh, let's figure out the measurements of everything. So in the first place, the volume, because there's three variables, the volume function will be a function of three variables, x, y, and l. Now what is the formula for volume then in terms of those three? x, y, l, the product of those three measurements. Okay, so volume is one of the things that we're talking about, one of, the, one of the measures of this box that we're talking about. What's the other kind of measure that we're talking about? Besides volume, we're also talking about surface area, right? So now we need to come up with a formula for the surface area. So I'll call it S, the 
surface area x, y, l. Okay. <clears throat> well, how will we do it? Okay, that sounds really good. Let's think about it. Why should it be this way? Well, <clears throat> let's, let's ignore everything except for this front face. What's the area of that front face? Just, just the front face. Just that bit. Yeah. The YL. Just, just the front face by itself. But then there's another face behind it, right? It's on the other side. So we get another one of those, right? So it would be YL plus YL. That's the front face and the back face. How about this left face? It'd be XY, but then there's this other one that's just on the other side, right? So there'd be uh, plus XY plus XY. So that's the front and back face, the left and right face. What are we leaving out? The, the top and bottom face, right? XL. So XL plus XL. And then as, as she said, uh, yes, you could simplify this to uh, 2YL plus 2XY plus 2XL. Okay, the volume. We have, so, so now we have a drawing, and from this drawing we've been able to come up with a formula for the volume and also a formula for the surface area. Okay. So now, to use the method of Lagrange multipliers, there's two functions, and it's good that we have two functions here. Uh, however, in the method of Lagrange multipliers, we have to figure out which one is which. So what are the names of the two different functions in the method of Lagrange multipliers? So it's from the previous page. One of them is called the blank. <laughs> function and the other one is called the other blank function. The constraint and the objective. Right. So in, in this exercise, which one is the objective? Function. And why is it the objective function in this exercise? Okay, so if it's surface area, then why is it the surface area? So in, in my personal opinion, uh, everyone, including this textbook, refers to the object, refers to calls this thing the objective function. And I personally think it's kind of a bad name. It's not a, it's, it's not a good name because it's kind of confusing. So, so that's why in red and parenthetically, I reminded you that, you that the objective is the function that you wish to minimize or maximize. Okay? The function that you're saying, we want to minimize this thing or maximize this thing. So in this exercise, in the box exercise, which one is the objective? The, the volume, right? So the objective function is the volume function. Because that's, that's what we're trying to um, maximize. OK. So then now, how about the constraint function? Okay, it, it, so yeah, sort of by process of elimination, right? <laughs> okay, so now to be slightly tricky, or picky you might say, really the constraint function is not S. Because remember that according to the way that we define things, the constraint function is a function that is such that 
we're, we're trying to do the equation blah blah equals zero. Okay, so, so where s is concerned, where s is concerned, we don't want s to be zero. What do we want, what do we want s to be? Six, right? Because it's saying, find the dimensions in volume of a closed rectangular box with maximal volume given, <coughs> given, subject to, surface area is six. So we want surface area equal six. So the surface area function is not the constraint function. What's the constraint function? Yeah, it would be s minus six, right? Which is to say, I'll say uh, that, just to give it a name, the constraint function, I'll call it c, is x, y, l, is the surface area function, 2yl plus 2xy. plus 2xl. And then minus 6. And the reason why we have to do this is so that the constraint is specified by c of x, y, and l is equal to zero, because we have to have blah, blah, blah equal zero. Okay, so any question about this? So now, for those of you that have looked at the homeworks that are due, the written homeworks that are due on Thursday, there's a question actually quite similar to this one. So I hope you're starting to see um, some similarities. So what's the, what, what kind of shape are we dealing with in that specific homework exercise? A cylinder in that case, right? In that case, the question is, is that um, what is the, what, what are the dimensions? Uh, what was it? I think it was, did I want you to minimize the surface area or maximize the volume? can't remember now. But at any rate, the question was, is what is the optimal cylinder? And then there was, there was surface area and volume involved. Okay. So now, um, in the statement of the method of Lagrange multipliers, on the previous page, there were three equations. How many equations will there be in this exercise? There's going to be four. Why is there going to be four? Alternatively, in this statement on the previous page, why were there three? So you're always going to have this one right here, because this, this represents the constraint. So in a sense, I'm asking, how come there's two of these? Because there's two variables. That's why. In the statement of the exercise, there's an x and a y. So there's an x partial and a y partial. So in this, in this exercise, there's three variables. One, two, three. That means that there's going to be three equations just for the variables. And then there's going to be one more for the constraint. So what, I'm, what I want you to observe from this is that there's always one equation per variable and then always another one for the constraint. If I gave you an exercise that somehow had 1,325 variables in it, then how many equations would there be? <laughs> 1,326. One more than that, right? Okay. <clears throat> There will be four 
equations because there are three variables and one constraint. Now, we're not going to do it in this class, but for those of you that, I, I know that many of you are coming from the business school and that kind of thing, and supposing you go on to do quantitative finance or operations type, uh, type situation, business operations and things like that, it's very common to have more than one constraint. Very common. So instead of just the one constraint, not only does that need to be true, but this other thing needs to be true also. The general rule is that it's the, the, the number of equations is one for each variable and one for each constraint. So if you had 100 variables, which, by the way, is not at all unreasonable for a largish large business. Right? Something like Walmart is solving things like this with thousands of variables. So if you, have, if you have 100 variables and 20 constraints, then you're going to be solving a system with 120 equations. Okay? I promise that we'll never do anything like that on a quiz. That would, I just won't do it. That'd be terrible. Okay, so, but for this, we can, we can do it. Okay, so that is to say that we'll have the x partial of the volume is lambda multiplied by the x partial of the constraint. I'm just writing these down just so you can look at them. So that x partial of the volume is lambda times the x partial of the constraint. And then the y partial of the volume is lambda times the y partial of the constraint. The L partial of the volume is lambda times the L partial of the constraint. And then, what's the last one? The constraint is zero. Okay, so what we need to do <coughs> is write all that down. That is to say, evaluate all that stuff. So what's the x partial of the volume? YL is lambda times, and then what is the x partial of the constraint? Right? So the x partial of this term is 0, the x partial of that term is 2y, the x partial of this term is 2l, and then that goes to 0. So that would be 2y plus 2l. Okay, the y partial of the volume is what? xl, and then lambda times the y partial of the constraint. So that would be 2L plus 2X. Okay. Then the L partial of the volume is XY. Time multiply is lambda uh, multiplied by the L partial of the constraint. So that'd be 2y plus 2x. And then finally, the constraint. So uh, 2yl plus 2xy plus 2xl is equal to 6. So I already moved the 6 to the other side. So any question about just writing down the system? So in the end now, this is what we must solve. Okay. 
So I'll number these equations in the usual way. I'll call this equation 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, now a couple things. So in the first place, uh, I, I told you that as a matter of strategy, when you're trying to solve a Lagrange system, what variable are you always supposed to solve for first? That's one of the things we said last time. But unfortunately, there's been a weekend in between then and now. <laughs> right. So you always solve for lambda. Always solve for lambda first. So we're going to do that. And so I'll write that down. We, we're always going to solve for lambda first. <coughs> Now that being said, um, some equations, some systems of equations are sort of easy to solve, and uh, like if you if you've done the exercises, if you've already done the homework exercises, say you will have realized eh, some of them are easier to solve than others. This is one of the hard ones to solve. This one's kind of uh, mm -hmm. it requires, in the end, a trick. And this is one of the reasons why I would never give you this exercise on a quiz, uh, at least letting you, at least you seeing it for the very first time, because everyone would get trick, uh, tricked up by just not having seen this trick before. <coughs> okay. So it requires a bit of a trick. So what we're going to do is is we're going to solve for lambda. <coughs> in all equations 1, 2, and 3. That is to say, we're going to do, we're going to do all of them. So supposing we solve for lambda in equation 1, then how could, if, ignoring that for a moment, well, I'll just write it down, who cares. So YL is lambda 2Y plus 2L. So how could we solve for lambda? Right. So we could divide uh, both sides by this term in parentheses. So we would get uh, yl and then divide mm -hmm. by 2y plus 2l. Okay, so what I want you to observe is that we did that in equation one, and we're going to do that for all of them. <coughs> uh, for equation two, the result looks like looks like XL over two uh, X plus two L is lambda. And finally, for the other one, xy over 2x plus 2y is lambda. So now we've got three different ways to write lambda. On the one hand, lambda is that, and lambda is also that, and lambda is also that. So just so we can refer to these by name, I'm going to call this equation 5, 6, and 7. What I want you to see is that we could say we could take 5 and 6 together. Take 5 and 6 together and say this one is equal to that one. So I'm going to write that down real quick. So y plus l, or sorry, not y plus l, yl over 2y plus 2l is xl 
over 2x plus 2l. That's taking equation 5 and 6. <laughs> that is just a mistake. <laughs> that should say 2L. <clears throat> okay, so now let's, let's look at this equation for a moment. And this is, this is part of the trickiness of it. Is, is we can simplify this equation actually a great deal. We can simplify it a great deal. How could we do it? <clears throat> what do you think? So I'd like for you to observe one thing. <coughs> in the first place. So ignoring the denominator for just a moment and just looking at the numerators, do you notice that the numerators have something in common? They both have the L. So the first thing I propose is that we, we somehow cancel the L's. So how can we cancel the L's? Okay, so, I'll, so we'll do that. I'll say, okay, uh, what I'll do so I'll do yl over 2y plus 2l is xl over 2x plus 2l. And then I'll, I'll write that division by writing uh, 1 over l and 1 over l. OK. So now I have a question for you. Is that a legitimate thing to have done? That is, in the end, I'm asking, can, can you in fact divide by L? <coughs> Sorry? OK. <coughs> so I agree that if you, if you do some operation, in, gen generally, you've got to do it to both sides. So like you could add 5 to both sides. Or you could multiply both, both sides by 2. <coughs> but is it, is it always permissible to divide by an L? And the answer is, no, it's not always permissible. What could go wrong? In, in principle, that's okay, because that, that's equivalent to dividing by L. So, for example, it's, it's always, it is, in fact, always permissible to divide both sides by 3. That's always okay. It is always permissible to divide both sides by negative 8. That's also okay. But you can't multiply both, you can't divide both sides by just anything. What must be true? It must not be 0. So my question to you is, is can we proceed, which is equivalent to asking, is it true that L is not zero? Okay, why? Wouldn't be a box, right? What would it mean? What would it mean if L were zero? It, it would be <laughs> one of the links would be zero, which would mean that it would, in fact, not be a box anymore. It'd be a rectangle, at most, right? <laughs> at most. It would be like a box where one of the dimensions is zero. So, is it clear that, that x, y, and l each, in fact, because this is a physical problem, in fact, must all be positive? Otherwise, this is not a real, th this, is, this is not a physical problem. So, yeah, that's a fine thing to do. Okay, so we do that. So y, is, uh, sorry, the left-hand side is y over 2y plus 2l. And then 
the right hand side is x over 2x plus 2l. Okay. So now there's another really significant simplification that we can make. What can we do? What do you mean, two? Okay, so I think, I think you mean that in the end, we could somehow factor out the two, and then the twos come out, and then we cancel them. I agree with that, uh, but there's something more, and, and that, that would be fine for you to do that, but there's something even more, even a, even a better fruit that's still low-hanging. And this is another part of the trickiness. It, it's quite obvious once you see it. But seeing it is a little tricky. Yeah, let, let's, let's cross multiply. That is to say, we'll, we'll multiply, you know, do the cross multiply thing. This x times that, and this y times that. Let's do that and see what happens. So suppose when we do that, the new left-hand side is y multiplied by 2x plus 2l. And the new right-hand side is x multiplied by 2y plus 2l. So now let's distribute the left and right-hand side. We distribute the y in on the left-hand side and get 2xy plus 2yl and distribute the right-hand side and get 2xy plus 2xl. So if it wasn't clear before, now I hope it's clear. What happens now? the two xy's go away, right? Because we've got it on both sides. So those cancel. So that is to say these cancel. Cancel. So that we get 2yl is 2xl. Now what? Now the, okay, now the L's go. So do you see that the L's can, can go? <laughs> we'll do it one at a time, it's fine. So the L's cancel. So that we have 2Y is uh, 2X. So Y is X, right? Now, that's an interesting algebraic result. That's saying that x and y have to be the same. What does that mean with respect to the actual problem? Because remember, it's, it's important not to lose sight that we were actually, a few minutes ago, talking about shapes, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So, so, and we know from the outset that the answer's got to be a cube. So what, what is this specifically saying? Right. We've said that, oh, one of the sides is a square, and so is its opposite side. That's what we have established here. Now, this, this is a result. This, this is a result of having, of having mm -hmm. taken equations five and six. So what else could we do now? Ah, we could take, we did five and six, how about we take six and seven? OK. 
Okay, and then we'll, we'll need to give this one a name because it's important. So we'll call that equation 8, having established that y is x. Okay, so from 6 and 7, from 6 and 7, uh, do you observe that we'll say this one is that one, they're the same, and what will cancel? What's the first thing that will cancel? The x's will cancel, right? In the exact same way that these l's canceled. When we do this one, the x's will cancel. So let's do that rapidly. Uh, fine, so then xl is 2x plus 2l uh, over that is equal to xy over 2x plus 2y. <clears throat> okay, the x's cancel. So the, we get L is, uh, sorry, L over 2x plus 2L. is y over 2x plus 2y. Now we can multiply, cross multiply both sides. I'll go ahead and do a little bit of that in my head so that we get what? 2xl plus 2yl is equal to 2xy plus 2yl the two YLs cancel so that we get 2XL is 2XY <coughs> but then we can cancel the twos and the X's and obtain what? That L is Y and call this equation 9. So now here's the thing what, so equation 9 in isolation by itself is also saying that this other face and its partner are a square. But taking equations 8 and 9 together, what are they saying? Yeah, it's saying that all the faces are a square, and moreover, all the faces have the same dimension. Because after all, if y is x, and y is L, then yes, L is X. <clears throat> so taking 8 and 9 together, we've established now that x is equal to y is equal to l. So they're all the same. Of course, that's in, completely in line with our expectation when we got started. <clears throat> so now what? <laughs> Believe it or not, there's actually an equation we haven't used yet. One lonely equation. What, what lonely equation has gone unused so far? This one, right? Equation 4. Equation 4 has gone unused. So let's use it. So equation 4 is... Uh, 2yl plus 2xy plus 2xl is 6. And what we established up here from, equ from this equation, that x and y and l are all the same, what that means is I can replace, I can make all of these l's, x's, and y's the same thing. So in a sense, which, which letter, among x, y, and l, which is your favorite? <laughs> X is, 
So we'll make it 2xx, x, because that y is an x and that l is an x, plus 2xx x, plus 2xx x is 6. Of course, xx x is x squared. So altogether, we have 2, 4, 6 x squared is 6, so that x squared is 1. Now, there's, there's two solutions to this equation. What, what are the two different solutions to this equation? 1 and negative 1. However, only one of those is permissible in this exercise. 1 is the only permissible one. Why is 1 the only permissible value? Because we're talking about a box, right? <laughs> Can you imagine? What if this pencil, what if that pencil had measurement 5, say, and this one had a measurement of negative 5? That would mean that if I very carefully placed this one on top of that one, then poof, <laughs> they'd be gone, right? That's what that would mean. <laughs> well, that's what I like to think about anyway. So the only answer is x is 1. That tells you, therefore, uh, that x is 1, y is 1, l is 1. So that's the measurements of the optimal shape. Each one is uh, side length 1. So what's the optimal volume? Yeah, so the volume, when all the side lengths are 1, is 1 times 1 times 1, right? x, y, l, which is 1. So by way of conclusion, the optimal rectangle Uh, sorry, the optimal box, the optimal three-dimensional rectangle is this one. When this is one, and this is one, and this is one, and it has volume one. <clears throat> Interesting. Any question about this? Okay, so the, uh, there, there's, like I had mentioned, so in the first place, when I started this exercise, which, has, which spanned three pages, uh, I, gave, <laughs> I gave you the, the warning that in the first place it's kind of a complicated exercise, and in the first place I hope you don't become over-anxious when we're doing it because this, I'm not going to ask you to do this large of a question on a quiz. Okay, so please be at ease. Uh, however, one of, one of the written homework exercises is just like this one, honestly, the cylinder one. And you, you'll find, when you've done it correctly, that a lot of things will be the same. Like we, for this one, for the optimal shape, we, we determined, oh, huh, the optimal shape is when this is the same as that, is the same as that. Interesting. Well, you'll probably find something similar um, in the cylinder case. Good. So any questions about this? Okay, so now we move on to something else entirely. So the next section is section 9.5, which is called differentials. and approximations. So, uh, in order to make this, the idea clear, I'm going to remind you of what this meant when you were taking Calculus 1, because this is a topic that you already studied in Calculus 1, 
but it was for a simpler kind of function. And now we're dealing with more complicated functions, so I want to remind you the of the simpler thing that you already know. That is to say, in the case when the function had signature reels to reels. So in that case, we had the following picture, the following kind of picture. So suppose that this is y is f of x. <clears throat> now, the uh, point of view for about half of calculus is that um, if the function is nice and smooth, like this one is nice and smooth, then at a small enough scale, the function begins to look flat. So be very careful when you hear a mathematician say flat, because in common parlance, among when you're not talking to mathematicians, when someone says flat, they usually mean horizontal. But that's not what I mean here. So when I say that at a small enough scale this thing looks flat, I mean that it looks like a straight line in the same sense that that wall is flat, but it's definitely not horizontal. Okay? So the calculus point of view, is, about half of the calculus point of view is the following. Is that, well, suppose that we're at this particular input, C. Then how could we determine the output of the function? For, the, for, for input C. Now, if I give you a formula, that would, you'd say, well, just plug it in, right? But I didn't give you a formula, I give you a picture. So how do you determine the output from the input given the picture? Right, you say, okay, well, I'll go straight up until I hit right there. And then, what does that tell me about the output? Right, now I go this way. So, what I want you to imagine is that if I were to grab hold of this input C and then wiggle it around, you'd see this thing moving around on the red, and you'd see this one also wiggling up and down on the output axis. So a wiggle on the input axis results in a wiggle on the output axis. So if this is C, and this is function F, then what is the name for this value? F of C. Okay, so the calculus point of view, about half of it, is that if you were right there on the red F world, and if you were really small, then the F world to you would look flat, like this. And the flatness of the F world there, that, the, that blue line right there, that blue flat thing, is so important that it ends up getting its own name. What is the name for the blue flat thing? The tangent line, right? That's its name. <clears throat> okay, and the idea is, what, what, what the calculus is saying, it's saying that if you're really small to you, as long as you're close to that point, there's really not much difference between you being on the red thing versus the blue thing. You really wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So for example, if I could magically transport us to Kansas, 
in, at high noon, and we were all there under the high sun, Kansas, it, which if you're not aware is, is, a, is a state, and it's very flat. When you look out, it just looks flat. Now suppose that I say, now, <laughs> since I'm magic and I teleported us there, another aspect of my magic is that we're not actually standing on the earth. We're actually standing on a tangent plane that I attached to the earth. And now we're going to take a walk around and we're going to walk on the tangent plane. What I'm telling you is that if you walk just a few hundred feet, you wouldn't notice a thing. You would say, well, I don't know, it looks to me like I'm still on the earth. Doesn't look any different. Now, if you were to walk a few thousand feet, a few miles, then you would start to notice, oh, I'm like, I'm like 20 feet off the ground now. Because I'm standing on the tangent plane and not the earth. Okay, so I'm saying the same thing about this, is that if you're near here, then you really can't tell the difference. But if you get far away, like if you were to walk all the way to, say, right here, that's a pretty big difference compared to that, right? That's a pretty big difference. That's noticeable. Over here, you could hardly notice a thing. Okay, so another matter that I want to bring up is that uh, another aspect of calculus that is important to help your conceptual understanding is that when you're dealing with calculus from the differential point of view, from the I consider everything to be flat point of view, What you're doing, part of what you're doing conceptually, is you're saying that, well, I'm going to consider the origin of coordinates to be here. The actual origin of coordinates is over here, right? This is where x and y are 0, over there. But here, this is where we attach the tangent. So now let me try to explain the difference. So on the, on the surface of the Earth, on the surface of the Earth, uh, the, 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 the coordinate system that is in most common use is the latitude-longitude coordinate system. Right? And I don't know it off the top of my head, I wish I did, but you know, Dallas, as in the city, the area, DFW, is sitting at some particular latitude-longitude. I don't know what they are, but, but in principle we could look it up. My question to you is, is where is the origin of coordinates for the latitude-longitude system? Where is it? It's, it's not here, <laughs> I can tell you that. So let's think about it for a moment. What is the zero latitude? <laughs> the way I remember it is that latitudes are the ones that are horizontal. So zero latitude is the equator. Zero latitude is the equator. So the longitudes are the ones that go around the poles. So what's zero longitude? That, that's that's uh, not it, that's, that's um, 180. Not the poles. So the, the zero longitude goes from one pole to another pole, and it goes, it goes from one pole, from, from the North Pole to the South Pole, and it does going through one specific city. What city does zero longitude go through? Yeah, Greenwich. Greenwich, yeah, the prime meridian. Goes through Greenwich, England. Okay. Why England? Well, because they were the ones calling all the shots <laughs> when, when the, that, this system of coordinates was set out. <laughs> you know, the British Empire, all that history, whatever. So, so zero latitude is the, 
is the equator, and then zero longitude is going through, is going from the North Pole to the South Pole by way of Greenwich, England. So the origin of the latitude-longitude system is you start out in Greenwich, England, and then travel directly south to the equator, which I believe is out in the middle of the Atlantic. <laughs> Okay, well, that's interesting. The origin of coordinates is literally where essentially no one is now or is hardly ever. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying about this. This origin of coordinates, yeah, it's right there, but that's not even close to what we're talking about. We're talking about right there. Okay? It, it's in the same sense that human beings sort of innately have their own origin of coordinates, each of us. So more or less the origin of, of each of our coordinate systems is, well, right, right behind our eyeballs, right? Mine's right here. <laughs> Where's yours? <laughs> right behind your eyeballs, right? Okay, so, <clears throat> so from here, from here, suppose that uh, from this input right here, we were to travel just a little bit to the side, say, to this input right there. So the, we, in, this, in this diagram, we increase the input just a little bit. So now we have this new vertical. And now we've got a new red point and also a new blue point. Okay, so then here and there, that one and that one. So let's say that this particular uh, horizontal distance is delta x. Okay, so then we, from the input, we move to the right delta x. So what's this, what is this input? C plus delta x, right? Because we started at C and then we went to we went to the right delta x. So that's so that input is C plus delta x. Okay, that means that well, just copying this that's, that's right here to over here. This is f of C. That's just copying from there. Uh, then this one right here. That is to say, that value right there. What's that uh, y value? F of c plus delta x. <clears throat> so now this measurement here, if we're calling this horizontal distance delta x, then what are we calling this vertical distance? Delta y. So this one's delta x, that one's delta y. But we also have one more. We have this one. So not only do we have this one, which is delta y, we also have this one. And the question is, is what's the name for this one? So many students can, can get to hear, you know, where I ask all these questions, and then this is, this is where it usually breaks down. <laughs> what's the name? So this one is called delta y. What's this one called? I'm, it, it is on the blue line. The tangent. Well, okay. I... This one's tricky. Okay, so since there's not going to be any, if, if it's not answered immediately, it's usually not answered at all. So this one is called dy. That's dy. 
So this one, what the red one does, that's delta y. What the original f world, the red world does, how it actually changes is delta y. But how the tangent world changes, how the tangent world changes, that thing is called dy. It's called dy. So now this one, this horizontal bit, is also called dx. So, so these are the same. Delta x and dx in this context are the same thing. But what I want you to observe is that delta y and dy are not, this, not necessarily the same thing. So now here's if I can do it. So here's the, you can do it, machine, okay. This is the calculus point of view, to say it again, and to maybe not labor it too hard. You can see those two points right there. They're kind of far apart. The calculus point of view is, is that if I move this point, if I make delta x small, then watch what happens to the difference between the red and the blue. At that point, the red and the blue are pin strokes that are fat enough to where you can't even separate them anymore. Out here, they're not nearly the same. Over here, it's really big. But near here, near, the, near this point right there, they're just about indistinguishable. <clears throat> so, The differential approximation is, <clears throat> what's the, what is the, the last thing that we have yet to write, is that what's the slope of the blue line? It is, yeah, dy over dx, and in particular that'll be f prime evaluated at c. So the slope of this is f prime evaluated at c. And what I want you to observe is the following, is that if from here, if from here you went over a distance dx, then you would go up a distance dy. If you went to the right from here, you went dx, and to stay on the blue, you'd have to go up dy. Well, that rise over run, dy over dx, is that. And the differential approximation is so the differential is that dy is exactly f prime evaluated at c dx. That is to say, taking this equation right here. <coughs> and multiplying both sides by dx. And the approximation is, so now here's where I get, here's where I get to do the typical joke in reverse, right? The, the, the usual joke is that we take, we take Greek symbols and perform a limit and then the Greek symbols become <clears throat> what? Latin symbols. <laughs> now we're going to go in the other direction, which is to say that these Latin D's are going to become what? Greek deltas. Uh, delta Y. and the equal becomes approximately. So delta y is approximately f prime of c delta x. OK. 
Okay. So r really, like this, this picture right here in this explanation is basically all of differential calculus right here. So now let's, uh, let's do an exercise where you actually use, uh, use this fact. Okay. So, so for example, Estimate the square root of 122 and a half using differentials. Now, before, before we get to the business of doing that, I'm going to point out what the question does not say. The question does not say, type that into your calculator and then write down what it says. It, it doesn't say that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that because every time I give a question like this, that's what some student does, and then they get a zero, and, and, and then f frequently they come and ask me why they got a zero. Okay? So, so I just don't want that to happen to anyone. So estimate this using differentials. <clears throat> OK, well, let's think about this for a moment to explain the thought process. So in the first place, off the top of my head, I do not know the square root of 122 and a half. I don't know it. But I do know the square root of a number that's kind of close to that. Is there, a, is there a number that's kind of close to that? Can you think of one that's kind of close to 122 and a half that you actually do know the square root of? 121. So we all should know the square root of 121, which is 11. So I, I'm, I'm telling you that we should have an, ex, an expectation about the answer. 122 and a half is a little bit more than 121. The square root of 121 is 11. So the answer to this question should be a little more than 11. <coughs> okay, it should be a little more than 11. So visually, what we're going to do to do this is we're going to use y is the square root of x. We're going to consider that, and we're going to kind of say, well, I don't really, I don't really care for x is 122 and a half. I don't like it. I actually prefer 121. That's where I want to start. And so now I'm going to draw a picture for you. And to answer this question, you don't have to draw a picture. This is me explaining to you all the fine details of what's happening. So the square root function looks like you take a parabola, turn it on its side, and only take the top half. That's what square root looks like. So it kind of looks like that. So that's y is uh, the square root of x. And what we're asked for we're asked for this. We're asked for 122. What happens when you give input 122 and a half? So what we're actually going to do is we're going to say, OK, 122 and a half. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to move a little bit to the left over to 121 where I'm more comfortable with the arithmetic. So now I'm going to move over here to the left. And this is obviously not to scale. I have to move way to the left. Otherwise, the picture is difficult to look at. So we move over here to 121.
Now, because 121 is easy to deal with, <coughs> We already know what the output is going to be when we get when we use 121. What's the output? 11. And what we're going to do is at that point we're going to attach the tangent line. So the tangent line looks something like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this value right here. Uh, it's a little bigger. We're going to use this value as our estimate. Of the output. So is our estimate going to be uh, an underestimate or an overestimate? It's going to be an overestimate, right? So this is going to be our estimate right here. Whereas this one right here is the true value. So to kind of put this into, to anthropomorphize the situation a little bit, you could say it's something like this. You could say, well, we're going to travel on the red highway. And we want to know where are we going to be when we've traveled 122 and a half miles. That would tell us the true value. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to travel on the red highway and we're going to travel until we get to 121 miles. Then we're going to take the exit and travel. Instead of the red highway, we're going to travel along its blue tangent for a further one and a half miles. So instead of traveling 122 and a half, we're going to travel 121 and then one and a half further. OK. <clears throat> so we're going to, again, like it says up there, we're going to use y is the square root of x, and we're going to start at, what is the x value we're going to start at? 121. And then how much further do we have to go after that? 1.5. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this equation right here, and we're going to find the differential equation. dy is something or other dx. So what's, what is dy dx for this? 1 over 2 square root x. So I'll do it in slow motion, if you like. So I'm imagining that the square root of x is x with exponent half. So that it would be half, and then x to half minus 1. Well, and then half minus 1 is negative half. And then we could make this have a positive exponent by putting it in a denominator, right? So that it would look like 1 over 2 x with exponent positive half. But then, while we're doing all this, we might as well rewrite x to half as what? Square root of x. So this last thing that I wrote, 1 over 2 square root x, it is worth your time to memorize that the derivative of square root of x is 1 over 2 square root x. It's, an, it's a very common uh, thing. 
So as a result, what's dy? Well, it's that dx, right? Because ignoring all of that step in the middle, dy dx is that. So dy, if you like, multiplying both sides by dx is dy. dy is that dx. OK. So this is the, the differential equation. So now how do we get the approximation equation? <laughs> the convert to Greek, right? The reverse joke <laughs> is that delta y is approximately 1 over 2 square root x delta x. OK. So now what we do is we take <coughs> this data and we plug it in here. That is to say, let's put those values in. So delta y is approximately 1 over 2 square root 121 multiplied by 1.5. So now we can simplify this. Well, uh, square root of 121, like we've said five times already, is 11. Times 2 is 22. And then, just because I'm trying to avoid using a calculator for as long as possible, I'll write 1 and a half is 3 over 2, so that I could simplify this uh, to 3 over 44. So I have a question then. What does this 3 over 44 have to do with anything? Is it the answer? Well, I mean, what, what is the 3 over 44? I'm sorry? It's what we need to add to 121, right? Because, because what it's saying, what it's saying is that we, we were traveling, right? We took the input from 0 all the way to 121. When we did that, we came to this point, and we were already at output 11. We had already made it to 11. Then, on the blue, we went a further one and a half to the right. And then, while we were going one and a half to the right on the blue, the blue went up 3 over 44. That's what it did. So the blue went up a little bit more. So the answer is y plus delta y is approximately, well, that would be uh, taking all of uh, this, so that would be square root x plus 1 over 2 square root x delta x, which is just to say now we're taking all of this data and doing it again, if you like. So you plug 121 in there, what do you get from that? 11 plus 3 over 44. So now, does that, does that make sense in terms of the question? So can anyone in plain language say why our claim that 11 plus 3 over 44 makes reasonable sense about the question? Why does it make sense? Right. It's saying that, well, 
I don't know what the square root of 122 and a half is, but I know what the square root of 121 is. The square root of 121 is 11. So if I were to start here and then go a little bit more to the right, then, well, the answer ought to be a little bit more than 11, right? A little bit more than 11. Okay, so now, on such exercises, it's a good idea to um, check with a calculator to see if it makes sense. So now, that's the answer, but a good way to check, let's do a calculator check. So if we type 11 plus 3 over 44 into the calculator, my calculator reports that that is 11.068118, and it just keeps repeating. Okay. Now, with the calculator, let's really check it. The other way, let's actually type this into the calculator, because the calculator is actually able to do that as well. How will the calculator respond to that? My calculator responds with 11. Point Zero six seven nine seven eight one. So did we get close? Yeah, that's pretty close. That's pretty close. Furthermore, how when we even were able to look at the picture and say that well, if we were to use the blue, would it be an underestimate or an overestimate? From the picture. It says, the picture is saying, well, it's going to be an overestimate. <coughs> did our estimate actually turn out to be an overestimate? Yeah, it did. Good. So do you remember this? I hope you have fond memories of this from Calculus 1. This, this entire thing has been reviewed. So now we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to do it for the more complicated case. That is to say that in Calculus 1, you did it for the case reels to reels. Now we're going to do it real squared to reals. <clears throat> and for reasons that I'm not going to get into, its name changes from differential to total differential. At least in this context, anyway. Now, don't get me started. Total differential. That is to say, the differential for functions that have signature like r squared to r. <clears throat> so, given function z is f of x and y, the total differential is, in the first place, denoted dz. So just like when we were dealing with y is f of x, the differential was denoted dy. Here, when it's z is f of x and y, the differential is denoted d and then output name. The output's name is z, so it's dz. And now it looks like this. The x partial dx plus the y partial dy. Now, one thing you need to understand about this definition is that this definition works equally well for functions that have more than two variables. 
Okay, so if this function had three variables, then there'd be the sum of three things, right? This one, this one, and another one. If it had 47 variables, it'd be the sum of 47 different terms, right? The first differential term, the second differential term, blah, blah, blah. Okay, <clears throat> now I want to explain why, why should the total differential look like this? Okay. <clears throat> so why this? In the end, why should it look this way? Okay. So by way of reminder, when we're looking at something like this, this specific case, this is z, and then which, which axis is which? Do you still remember? Which one is this one? This one is x, and then this one is y. <clears throat> okay, so now suppose that we're in between two inputs, say in between this input, and this input, and also in between this input, this input. So this is the set of inputs. Then these functions, when you plot them, are surfaces, like water slide looking things. So like this, and blah, blah. You know, some nice looking thing. So you have to you kind of use your own imagination there. They're like a bit of flag that's frozen in time. You know, falling and frozen in time like that. So now I'd like for you to imagine that you're at some specific input. That input. Okay, then the output of the function is, well, you go straight up to it, just like we did two pages ago, and then you hit the surface right there. And because this thing is smooth, if you were to rub on the red surface, it doesn't have any pointy places or edges. It's quite smooth. If you were to be walking around on the red world, then it would look, if you were, and, and if you were small enough in comparison to it, then it would look flat. Now again, don't confuse flat with horizontal. By flat, I mean like a, like a plane in this case. The wall is flat, but it's not horizontal. If you were really small, then you'd be, the red world to you would look like a flat plane in the same way that Kansas looks flat to us because we're so small in comparison to the earth. So what I'm telling you is that if you were to look extremely closely at that point with the calculus eyeball, look at that point, it would be flat looking to you. So now I'm going to draw what it would look like. This one has to be the same as that one. Okay. Does it? No, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, I gotta think about this for a second. So now I have to go back up. And this is kind of hard to draw properly. Okay, 
is supposed to be a flat piece of plane. So this is flat. <clears throat> so now, supposing that you're back here in this corner at the green point. that that green point is that green point. And you're standing there and looking ahead. The whole world looks flat to you. We'll call this little distance right here in the positive x direction, we'll call that dx. And we'll call that little distance in the positive y direction. So if we're calling this one dx, we're going to call that one dy, right? Now my question to you, conceptual question now, what is the slope? So you can, you can consider that line in the back by itself as a line and it's sloping in the y direction. So that, that's a line that, that, that we're considering only in the y direction. What is its slope? That is to say, if you were here on this corner of the plane, and remember the plane extends infinitely far because it's a plane. If you were to walk in the y direction, what slope would that be? Not quite. What tells you it, because you're going because you're going this way, it would be which one would it be? It'd be the partial of z with respect to y. So this has slope. Is the y partial? That's how much you're sloping in the y direction. What's the slope of this one? So if this traveling in the y direction, you have slope y partial, what do you have traveling in the x direction? The x partial. Y slope, X slope. Now the question is, is how much would your elevation change, how much would your elevation change if you moved from the green point here to the red point here? If you went from here to here. Well, yes? No, it's not. So. Your elevation would change. First off, your elevation would change some amount if you went from here to here. That is to say, from this corner to this corner. And then it would change a, it would change a possibly different amount from here to here. But the total change you could get by adding them up, right? You could say, well, I walk along this edge and my, my z changed that much. And then I walked along this edge and my z changed that much more. So you could just add them up, right? This one plus that one. Or you could do it in the other order. You could say this one plus that one. My question is, if you look in the back right there, how much do you go down? It could be up in a different picture, but how much do you change in this picture? Well. This change right here, that change right there, is the y slope multiplied by the distance you traveled in the y direction. Slope times distance. 
what will this one be? So what will that one be? So the graphite one is the Y stuff. This is the X stuff. How much does this one change? The X partial, right? That's to say how much you're sloping in the X direction. And then the distance you traveled in the X direction, DX. That's, this is how much your elevation changes on account of your, of your Y travel. And this is how much your elevation changes on account of your X travel. So what is the total change in your elevation? The sum of these two, right? And what do you get if you add these two together? That one. Okay. So it's a little bit more complicated because there's more directions to travel, but I hope it's clear now why things are the way they are. So you add these two together, and you get this one. And then I can't, <laughs> I can't effectively draw in any more dimensions, but I promise you that if we were talking about a 47-dimensional problem, then this works just as well. You just add up the change on account of your movement in each of the individual dimensions. <coughs> okay, fine. That being said, please don't think that this concept is scary because, because actually calculating this is almost as easy as can be. So suppose that I give you that Z is Nine x cubed uh, minus eight x squared y x squared y plus four y cubed. So given this, I want you to find dz. Okay, so uh, dz, what I, in the end, what I'm saying is, well, I want you to take all that stuff there, 9x cubed minus 8x squared y plus 4y cubed, all that stuff. I want you to compute the x partial and then write dx. And after you've done that, I want you to take all that stuff again, 9x cubed minus 8x squared y plus 4y cubed. And now what do I want you to do with it? Compute its y partial and then write dy. Now, I'm just writing this so you see it all once. But I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to write it like this. What I really expect from you is that you're just gonna write, not this thing, but what it actually is. What is the x partial of all of that? Mm-hmm. Sixteen, yeah, x y, and then that's it for that one. Okay, so then dx now plus what's the y partial? So not quite eight x squared. Negative. Negative 8x squared plus 12y squared dy. That's it. So this is not a, this is, 
calculating this is maybe less scary than you might have been led to believe, at least at first. So now, a common question that happens is students say, well, can I, I, can I simplify that somehow? I mean, you know, how do these combine? And the answer is, they don't. These live in totally different cities, and they don't talk to each other. <laughs> these things cannot be simplified. Uh, furthermore, furthermore, if you were, if you were to leave off, uh, say, a dy like that, then this would that would be not a minor error. Okay, that would be in a sense a categorical error, because the kind of thing that this is, that's to say, its kind, like an apple, is an apple and an orange is an orange. And, and it, it is not permissible to say that two apples plus three oranges is five oranges. And it doesn't work this way. This kind of thing is a differential. This kind of thing is a differential because it's a scalar function multiplied by a differential, so that makes it a differential. But this thing by itself is a scalar function. So leaving off the dy is literally like saying apple plus orange. It literally, it, it literally, from a mathematical point of view, makes approximately that much sense. Okay? So it, the, the differential part is a critical matter. Okay. So let's do another one. So what if I give you, say, um, <coughs> W is the natural log of a squared plus 4 times b squared and then plus uh, a cubed b and we'll do it like that. Okay, so then my question is find dw. do the A's first, only because A is before B in the alphabet. So what is the A partial of all this? So as for the first term anyway, the B, B is constant with respect to A. Uh, so then it's just a, you know, the, the derivative, it, it does something totally uninteresting with the derivative, right? B squared will just be hanging out. But what is the A partial of the log bit? Very good. So we'll get one over the argument to the log, because that's how log does its thing. And then for the chain rule, we'll need to multiply by the partial of a squared plus 4. So that gives an, a 2a. And then here's where that b squared is. It was just along for the ride because it was a constant. And then what's the a partial of a cubed b? Three. 3a squared b. And then this is dA. Okay, so that's the A uh, part of the differential. Then the B part, well, so now what's the B partial of the first term? Very good. Uh, 
and then the B partial of the second term. Very good. DB. <coughs> Any question about this one? OK, how about, how about from the Lagrange problem that we did a century ago? Uh, we said that it was XYL. That was the volume, right? We, we had a formula that was XYL. Please compute for me DV. So this one is slightly different than the previous ones. It's slightly different than the previous ones because this will be the sum of how many differential terms? Three differential terms, right? Because there's three variables. So I'll do them in the order here. So what is the x partial? Uh, what is the term the, par the differential term corresponding to x? Y L, and then d x, right? Plus. Now, what is the differential term corresponding to y? X L, d y, and then what is the differential? term corresponding to L. X, Y, D, L. <clears throat> okay, any question about this? So what I'm telling you is that, you know, we could take like the alphabet, right? I could say, I could say, uh, you know, alpha, to use some other <laughs> letter, is a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, blah, blah, right? <laughs> write it all out. Then we could write the total differential of that would just be su the sum of 26 differential terms. Okay. So now let's do, let's do an exercise uh, that isn't a problem. Well, before I do that, I guess I need to say one thing because I didn't mention it two pages ago. And that is that if this is the differential, the total differential, dz is the x partial dx plus the y partial dy, so there's the, the total differential, then my question to you is, is what is the approximation corresponding to this? This is, this is the differential, but what's the, the differential equation, but what's the approximation equation? It's the, it's the same bad joke, or good joke, <laughs> in reverse, right? The, the d's become deltas. So delta z is approximately that part plus this part. So this is the differential, and this is the approximation. <clears throat> OK. So now that we have uh, that, I could now ask a question. I could say, OK, I want you to estimate <clears throat> the square root of 2.98 squared plus 4.01 squared and I want you to do so using differentials. And notably, again, I want to point out what the question is not saying. It is not saying type this into your calculator and report what your calculator says. 
So can someone give us an idea? How could we go about doing this? I love it. So this is just like, just like, uh, you know, half an hour ago or whatever, when I said let's let's estimate the square root of 122 and a half, and so we said, well, how about we use the formula, square root of x. Here, now it's going to look like. Uh, well, square root of x squared plus y squared. Furthermore, uh, 2.98, that's kind of suggestive of a number that's close, isn't it? You know, 3. 3 is close to 2.98, isn't it? And what would be a number close to 4.01? How about 4? Now let's go with that for just a minute. Would that be at all a useful thing to consider? What if that were 3 and this were 4? then that would be 3 squared plus 4 squared, right? Well, what is 3 squared? 9. And then 4 squared. The sum of these is 25. Do we happen to know the square root of 25? How convenient. So does everyone see, in, in the end, the way this problem is sort of structured? OK. So we're going to use. <coughs> We're going to use the equation, uh, if you like, uh, z <coughs> is, as she said, the square root of x squared plus y squared. But furthermore, we need that other data, which is to say where we're going to start and how we're going to move. Okay, so we're going to start. At what x, y value? 3, 4, right? We're going to start at 3, 4. <coughs> and then we're going to change delta x, delta y is how much? So how much do we change for x? How much does the x change? Two hundredths, and now we need to be very careful and note that we're going two hundredths, that is to say 0 0.02 to the left. So what's the numeric value of delta x? Negative 0 0.02. Because we're starting at 3, and we've got to get to 2.98, so we're moving to the left. Uh, what is delta y? 0 0.01. And, and to try and make the previous point clear, why is it that it is positive 0 0.01? Because it's going up. Because we're moving to the right in the positive y direction. OK, good. Because, because we're going to start at 3, 4. So here, x is x is 3, and we want to get to 2.98. Yeah. And then, and then y is opposite. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to do this using differentials, which means that, OK, we've got z here. Let's compute dz, the differential of z. Well. That's going to be the x partial of all this stuff, right? But where square root, well, maybe you remember it. So it was only a few minutes ago. So if, we, <laughs> if I ask, ignoring this for a moment and going back to scalar calculus, what is, what is the derivative of square root x? 1 over and then denominator 2 square root x. OK. So having that memorized then, this is square root of some business, right? 
So the derivative of it will be 1 over 2, all of that, and then for the chain rule, multiply by the derivative of all that. Okay. So x partial dx, and then all that. y partial dy. Okay, so the x partial of all that, as we were just saying, that would be 1 over 2 square root x squared plus y squared. And then what else belongs here and y? A, a dx belongs here, but it, it comes even after something. 2x belongs here. I agree. And why does that 2x belong there? Right, it's the derivative of the, st of the stuff that's in the square root. So then multiplied by uh, differential dx. <coughs> okay, so to be clear, this bit showed up because of the chain rule. Okay, then we get another thing just like it for the y's. Gesundheit. So then this will be 1 over 2 square root x squared plus y squared. And now we'll get 2y and then dy. So now we can simplify this a little bit. Uh, well, for this part, I'll put, I'll put the 2x in the numerator, and then the 2s will cancel. So I guess uh, sort of the best thing we can get to for this is something that looks like 1 over, not 1. I just got finished saying I was going to put the x up there. x, and then square root x squared plus y squared dx and then plus y square root x squared plus y squared dy. So this is the total differential. Any questions about getting to it? Okay. So, <coughs> What we want to do is we want to approximate. So what's the, what is, how do we get the approximation equation? Yeah, to convert the, the, convert, convert the Ds, the Latin Ds to Greek Ds, deltas. So delta Z is approximately x over square root x squared plus y squared delta x plus y over square root x squared plus y squared delta y. And what do I do with this? Now that we have the approximation equation. Yeah, now we plug in our data. Delta Z is approximately, okay, so X is three. So that'd be three over, well, we already established this at the beginning, right? So then 3 squared plus 4 squared is how much? 25, the square root of which is 5. So this is 3 over 5, and then multiplied by negative 2 one hundredths, and then plus 4 over 5, 
multiplied by 1 one hundredth. So I'll go with that a little bit and try and simplify it without the aid of a calculator. So that'd be 3 over 5, and I'll put the negative out front, and then I'll write 2 over 100. This is just so I can do it mostly without a calculator. And then 4 over 5 times 1 over 100. So these have a common denominator of 500. So this would be negative 6 uh, over 500 and positive 4 over 500. So that would be negative 2 over 500. So negative 1 over 250. That's just so I can do it without a calculator. So now, is this the answer to the question? If so, why? If no, why not? So what is this? Approximation of what? Mm -hmm. It's saying that that's how much we changed. So the true answer is the one that we're looking for is z plus delta z. z plus delta z. <clears throat> uh, is approximately square root x squared plus y squared and then plus all this business. <clears throat> And really, I guess I'll write 3 squared plus 4 squared right here. So that is to say that the approximation is 5 minus 1 over 250. Now I have a question. Does that, does that make sense? like in the, in the way the question was phrased. I claim it does in the following sense, that I asked you to compute this crazy looking value. And you said, well, if we were, I see that's, that you want to do it at 2.98 and 4.01, but if we were actually at three and four, the answer would be five, if we were actually at three and four. So, surely, whatever this is, because that's not very far away from 3 and 4, surely the answer is close to 5. Is our approximation close to 5? It is. So that makes sense. Now, as a final check, let's check it with the calculator. So 5 minus 1 over 250, according to my calculator, is 4.996 and then if I type that other thing into the calculator so 2.98 squared plus 4.01 squared if I type all that into the calculator My calculator reports that that value is 4.996048439. So did we get close? We sure did. That's really close. That's, uh, so that means that we were close to, to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We can count that one because there's an implied zero there. Five significant digits. That's a lot, by the way. <laughs> that would be like saying, you know, you, I might say, wow, you look like you're 173 centimeters tall. And you say, actually, I'm 173 centimeters tall and also three tenths of a millimeter. <laughs> okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> okay, so that's all we have for today. So have a nice Tuesday. <clears throat>